1983, the newly formed Eagle Computer Incorporated was on the road to fast success in Silicon Valley. Building on their existing experience with computers under another name, Eagle had not only one of the more capable CPM machines on the market, but a true IBM PC clone that bested the machine it was cloning in a multitude of ways. And yet, despite high praise for their products, Eagle Computer was forced out of business in just a few short years due to a combination combination of lawsuits, a botched public stock offering, and the aftermath of a crashed Ferrari. What happened? This is LGR Tech Tales, where we take a look at noteworthy stories of technological inspiration, failure, and everything in between. This episode tells the unfortunate tale of Eagle Computer. The story of Eagle begins not in 1970s Silicon Valley, but on the opposite side of the country in 1970s Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. Brothers Gary and Charles Kappenman started a computer company called Audiovisual Laboratories, or AVL, with the goal of providing computerized multi-image slideshow programmers. For a time, these were the state of the art, using 35mm slides projected by multiple slide projectors onto one or more screens in synchronization with a voiceover or music track. AVL introduced the world's first microprocessor-controlled multi-image programming computers, the ShowPro 3 and 5, which were dedicated controllers that could not perform other tasks. However, as the personal computer revolution started taking off in the late 70s, AVL put their hat into the ring by building their first personal computer, the Eagle One, introduced in 1980 and becoming the first non-dedicated multi-image programming controller. It boasted a 16 kilohertz processor and a single-sided double-density 5 and a quarter inch disk drive for easily transferring multi-image programs but the hardware also allowed it to use the number one operating system of its day, Digital Research's CPM. With this additional capability, the Eagle line of computers became an industry standard for multi-image control equipment. Popularity and demand was so high that AVL opened offices on the West Coast, and this was where they chose to spin off their computer business as its own company, Eagle Computer, in May of 1982 in Los Gatos, California. Dennis Ray Barnhart, a former American fighter pilot who survived being shot down twice in Vietnam and had since become a skilled Silicon Valley businessman, spearheaded this founding of Eagle and was named president and chief executive officer. Under his direction, they built Eagle computers that were essentially the same as AVLs. They simply removed the AV ports and multi-image controller bits and replaced them with RS-232 serial and Centronix ports for connecting standard peripherals. They also offered several pieces of high-quality productivity software, namely Eagle Calc and Eagle Writer, making it even more appealing. Eagles proved to be versatile, well-built, and attractive CPM machines for professionals, with sales starting at a solid 500 units a month due to their existing reputation in the AV market. The industry was changing, though. Thanks to the monolithic computer company IBM entering the PC market the previous year, people were already starting to shift away from CPM computers and demand was rising for IBM's PCs. However, they were ridiculously expensive and massive in size, both of which could be improved in the eyes of many. So smaller computer manufacturers naturally wanted to clone the system and start selling cheaper PC compatibles, but of course, IBM did not allow this. Not only was the software different, but so was the hardware, and thanks to IBM's proprietary BIOS, no one could legally produce a clone. But did that stop Eagle Computer? Nope! Less than a year after the IBM PC was introduced, Eagle released the Eagle PC, an IBM PC compatible with an array of improvements. It was less expensive, built in a slimmer case, featured higher resolution graphics, had a slot for keyboard storage, and utilized a quiet, fanless cooling system. Hopes were high for the Eagle PC, and sales of their older machines were still going strong at 12,000 units a month, so management decided to take the company public on June 8, 1983. The stock offering for the company ended with a value of $37 million, resulting in the executives becoming instant multimillionaires. And that's when the unthinkable happened. Eagle's CEO, Denny Barnhart, was found dead hours later in a fiery car crash just a block away from company headquarters. 
While riding high on the news of the stock prices, he was looking at buying a shiny new red Ferrari from Sheldon Coy, president of a local yacht company. To this day, there are questions as to who was driving, but either way, the Ferrari veered out of control, flew through the air, tore through 20 feet of guardrail, and crashed into a ravine. While Mr. Coy survived in critical condition, Barnhart was pronounced dead on the scene. He was just 40 years old. Seeing as it was largely Mr. Barnhart's management skills that had led to that day's valuation of the company, an unprecedented move was made. Eagle's initial public offering would be rescinded, and everyone that had invested got their money back. Sadly for Eagle Computer, things were only going to get worse. While the stock was eventually opened up for purchase again, the value was far lower without Barnhart's leadership. Furthermore, the Eagle PC clone just seemed too good to be true. And that's because it was. Turns out that Eagle was a bit hasty in the cloning process, and their cloned BIOS contained code that IBM claimed they snatched without permission. IBM promptly sued the crap out of Eagle Computer, claiming they violated their copyrights on the code contained in the IBM BIOS. The case was settled out of court for an undisclosed sum, with Eagle agreeing to stop manufacturing their PC. But there was no way this was going to stop them from doing it again, this time legally with a portable computer and their own independently engineered BIOS. The result was the Eagle Spirit, which accomplished all they had set out to do and more. But it was too little, too late. Competition in the IBM PC clone market was heating up like crazy, with Compaq dominating after the introduction of the Compaq Portable in 1983. It was 100% IBM compatible, had higher build quality than Eagle Spirit, and had better specs at a lower price point. Due to the lawsuit, development on other Eagle PCs had been halted, and when they finally did come out, the sales never reached that level that shareholders demanded. Then, more lawsuits kept slapping Eagle across the face over the next few years, including a class action one from shareholders claiming that vital financial data had gone undisclosed, and another one from Lexisoft, the company that made the Eagle Writer word processing software. This was a hundred million dollar suit that claimed Eagle was illegally distributing and marketing the program as an Eagle product after the licensing agreement had expired. These were all settled in one way or another, but combined with the low sales and various distribution problems overseas, Eagle wasn't long for this world. By 1986, Eagle Computer Incorporated had lost more than $40 million, had debts of over $7 million, and only $200,000 in assets. Less than a dozen people remained on staff by the time they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 1986. After this, the remaining properties of the company were snatched up by Korean firm KENC America Corporation, and Eagle Computer was no more. From a promising shoot to the top of the AV market, and a ballsy move into the risky world of PC compatibles, to a shocking exotic car crash and seemingly endless lawsuits, Eagle Computer is a tale worth remembering and learning from, however unfortunate it may be. And if you like this episode of Tech Tales, then perhaps you'd like to see some of the others. There's a couple of them linked to right here, and many more on the playlist on my main YouTube channel, LGR. And if you want to see more videos on all sorts of other subjects, there's plenty there. So subscribe and watch, or whatever you want to do or not do, it's all good. Either way, thank you very much for watching this one.